Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars today. We are doing some very exciting things. We are talking about magnetars and fast radio bursts. We are also talking about a book. No, not that one. And also, I'm proud to announce at the beginning of a very beautiful relationship with the very first, finally, after years of searching, a cheese sponsor for the Space Radio. But that's coming later. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail to get yourself on the air. You can also follow along with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including but not limited to London, Canada, Ohio, just generically Ohio, which is basically all of it. And I'm allowed to say it because I live there. L- Pell City, Alabama, Cincinnati, Ohio, Penzance, England, Portsmouth, England, London, UK. We are St- uh, Stella Coom, Washington. We are Howell, New Jersey. We are Moscow. We are Perth, Australia. We are California, though you're moving to Illinois soon. Sorry about that. Oh, you, you, you did a smiley face, so you seem happy about that. Halifax, England, and Austin, quote, completely surrounded by Texas. Accrington, UK, Henty, Australia, Washington, D.C., and more. Wow. And Hershey, Pennsylvania, getting in at the last second. And let me tell you, the Space Cadets are very excited. They're as excited as I am about this cheese sponsor, but we're going to have to wait because we have to do our homework before we get a snack. And speaking of a Bucharest, Romania, uh, Sheffield, you got, oh man, I love the international audience for this show. I mean, just hitting me up with questions. We're talking about cool stuff. We're, we're exploring the universe together. It is just, we're just having so much fun together. And speaking of fun, have you guys heard about the Magnetar? That's right, the Magnetar. So, I want to set this this new story up because it's kind of a big deal. For the past like decade or so, we've been seeing these bursts of extremely strong radio emission known as fast radio bursts or FRBs. Or if you are a longtime listener to Space Radio, you know I call these FRBs. I call them Furbies because why not? Because that's what you get for naming something FRB. So we, we basically didn't know what they were or like we had our suspicions, of course, because uh, these things are intensely powerful, intensely powerful. Uh, these are at millimeter wavelength frequencies. So like pretty deep in the radio, but but pretty high energy radio as things go. And uh, they last like milliseconds. These are incredibly short bursts and they tend to jump from one frequency to another or slide from one frequency from uh, to another. And they come from all over. Like they come from every direction in the sky. They're just like a boop and then they're gone. And we only know of like a couple dozen of them. And uh, it was like a mystery. Like what in the universe could generate that much energy in the radio. The, the radio is a big clue. That means magnetic fields are involved somehow because magnetic fields are really, really good at generating strong radio emissions. But you need like really strong magnetic fields to make something this powerful, something that can that can bleep and bloop on a radar dish with that amount of radio intensity from outside the galaxy. It has to come from like something powerful. Well, finally, we found an FRB or Furby coming from within our own galaxy, and it was linked to a magnetar. A magnetar, in this is just astronomy fun words at like all day long. A magnetar is a highly magnetized neutron star. Oh, we're talking magnetic fields like 10 to the 15, like 10 to the 15 times stronger than the Earth's, like quadrillions of times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. Like these things are ridiculous. 
And this particular one that we observed in the galaxy uh, repeated itself, which which most FRBs or Furbies just happen once they're gone. Uh, this particular one happened to repeat itself. And so we were able to watch it more often. We were able to pin it down to a location. We figured out it is a highly magnetized neutron star going doing something weird it's just like 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 freaking out and releasing a tremendous burst of radio energy so we think that magnetars these highly highly magnetized neutron stars might be the source of frbs i put might there because there has been some research and i'm gonna have an article on this appearing in uh, space.com and live science sometime in the next couple weeks talking about how if you want magnetars to be the frbs the furbies then you need a certain population of magnetars to go crazy to generate the frbs and there doesn't seem to be that many that enough magnetars in the universe in order to be able to do it so i don't want to say that we have conclusively found every the, the source for all of these mysterious fast radio bursts likely it's something to do with magnetars uh, also in the news i did there are a couple other things uh the very large array i just want to talk about very very quickly like you know you know the very large array you know th this is the radio telescope out in the deserts of new mexico and it was you know, co-star along with Jodie Foster in the movie Contact. It just celebrated its 40th birthday. Well, happy birthday, Very Large Array. I have done some work personally with Very Large Array data. Uh, that was fun. It's a very, very famous telescope. They're upgrading it. They're, they're going to make it like, it's called like NGVLA for next generation VLA because that sounds pretty sci-fi. Uh, that, that's cool. Well, also in the roundup this week, we got uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine is mm, with the incoming Joe, Joe Biden administration. He said, I'm, I'm out. I'm done. Uh, he gave some various reasons like, oh, you need continuity. Basically, he knew he was going to get fired anyway, so he might as well call it ahead of time. What does this mean for the future of NASA and Artemis and all that? Who knows? Uh, we could do a whole episode on that and me ranting once again about how NASA is floundering because of lack of direction. But really, I, I want to pause there in the news. I can just there's there's been a whoops. There's been a lot of cool news this week, but I really, really, really want to get to your questions. So let me switch over. I do have some voicemails that we we just got to do. We got to get some voicemail love in here in this show. Uh, let's get let's get Steve going here. Let me see. Where do I hit the button? I hit it. I hit it here. I got it. I got it, guys. I got it. Come on. Come on over. Hi, Paul. Steve here from the UK. So escape velocity from the Earth is 11 kilometers per second. But that applies to ballistic objects like rockets and photons. If you have a space elevator, you can wave goodbye to Earth at any velocity you like, even walking speed. This put me in mind of a project, a plan at some time in the future to orbit a black hole. I'll choose a nice big supermassive one so I'm not subject to too much by way of tidal gravitational effects. From the back of my spaceship, I'm going to dangle a probe on a long wire through the event horizon, collect some data and reel the wire back in, thereby bypassing that annoying speed of light escape velocity limitation. My probe, once retrieved at a leisurely speed, will give me information from inside the black hole, which is impossible. Before I spend a lot of money on my project, I thought I'd run it past you to check if it will work. Is there more to the event horizon than merely escape velocity? Thanks, Paul. Okay, uh, that is a good, fantastic question, Steve. I really appreciate that. And you were right. You were right to ask me because, uh, uh, yes, there is more to the to the whole event horizon thing than 
adjust escape velocity. And I want you to think you're trying to cheat nature. Okay. Nature doesn't like a cheat. She will punish you when you try to cheat. So, so just don't try it. If you try to cheat and you're like, okay, I know I will be safely in orbit around the black hole and I will dingle a long wire, dip it below the event horizon and then pull it back. Like, what's the big deal? What am I, what am I getting wrong? I want you to think differently about the event horizon because the event horizon is not a surface. It's not like the, the surface of the earth with rocks and chairs uh, that you can launch yourself off of to get into space. The event horizon is just an invisible boundary in, in space. It's not a, it's not, it's a mathematical thing. It's not like a physical boundary that you can touch or see. I want you to think of gravity in a slightly different way than you normally do. And we're allowed to think of nature uh, of gravity in this way because of uh, the way general relativity works. I want you to think of gravity as an action that makes space-time flow. I want you to think of instead of space-time being static and we're moving around within space-time, I want you to think of space-time itself as flowing. And that if you have a gravitating object like say the Earth, this is causing space-time to flow towards the Earth. And like I said, you're allowed to make this switch. You're allowed to, to construct things this way. So in this view, if I want to launch off the surface of the Earth, I have to fight against that space-time that is uh, that is flowing me in one direction like a river, like there, uh, like a waterfall of gravity on top of me. And if I work hard enough, I can overcome that waterfall. Now, what happens around a black hole is that in rushing space, that in rushing space towards the black hole gets faster and faster and faster because that's exactly what strong gravity does. And then the event horizon is the point at which space itself is flowing towards the black hole faster than the speed of light. And that is why you can't escape the black hole because if you've crossed the event horizon and you try to leave, you have gravity, you have space itself flowing into the black hole faster than the speed of light and you have to overcome that in order to escape and you can't and so you're stuck. So this is what happens to your little probe at the end of the wire as it approaches the event horizon space itself near the event horizon is flowing into the black hole faster and faster and faster. So you have to work harder and harder and harder to pull it up until it reaches the event horizon and space itself is flowing inwards at the speed of light and you cannot beat that. Your cable will snap. Your line will break. It simply won't work because the probe is now being pulled away from you faster than the speed of light. And if you had, if you want to play uh, like a little mental game here, if you want to play a little mental game and imagine that your line or your cable is infinitely strong, which is not a real thing, but if it were infinitely strong, you have the probe down at the bottom that is now being pulled towards the black hole faster than the speed of light and it's attached to you. Guess where you're going? That's right. The black hole. Good guess. You're going to get dragged down to the black hole and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Remember that you can leave a voicemail to join the conversation or you can catch the live streams on YouTube and Twitch. Remember to go to spaceradioshow.com for all the links. This show is brought to you by you. Please visit patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you can keep this show going. We've got a ton of space cadet questions flowing in here like space into a black hole. And I want to make sure I answer as many as possible. Uh, let's go on. Uh, where should we start? Where should we start? Our neutron stars, this is from Visto Tutti on YouTube. Our neutron stars electrically charged 
or are they neutral? Neutron stars, even though the name is neutron star, even though they we say they're neutral or like they're made of neutrons, which are neutral, they do carry electric charge. And that's because the vast majority of the material inside of a neutron star is indeed neutral, new, made of neutrons. There are protons tucked in there in the little folds here and there deep in the material. And so there is enough of them to create an electric charge. These neutron stars are spinning crazy fast. And if, when you get charges spinning, you get magnetic fields. And that's why pulsars in general have strong magnetic fields. And then the magnetars get the absolute strongest magnetic fields possible. So great, great, great question. Larry Beckham is asking, is this the first magnetar candidate? No, we have several examples of magnetars. Magnetars, but not, and I actually, I want to say literally several. We only have, I don't know, like a dozen known magnetars at, at, um, known and it's basically any pulsar that is extremely rapidly spinning and has signs of an extremely strong magnetic field gets named as a magnetar so it's a certain category of pulsar that gives you a magnetar uh tom bach wants to talk a little bit about uh jim bridenstine's uh soon to be exit from NASA. He's asking, could this change be a positive for NASA? You know, I always paint these changes in a negative light. It could be. It's hard to evaluate Bridenstine's a role in leadership of NASA because it's so intertwined with the Trump administration and the goals of the Trump administration. I'd say he did fine. Uh, tr uh, Trump was a big proponent of NASA and a big supporter of NASA. NASA actually got a lot of money in the Trump administration and with the Republican Congress. With the Biden administration, a uh, Democratic Congress, uh, 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 who knows? Like, who knows? It could be... Artemis could get a big injection of cash. Maybe we can finally get the SLS off the ground. Maybe NASA's just going to go nowhere fast or or have a complete... Maybe we're going to go back to Mars again because it seems like every four years we change our mind of whether we're going to the moon or Mars. Like how schizophrenic can you get? Or who knows? Maybe, maybe we're going to get a new NASA chief and the new NASA chief is say, you know what? Venus. We are going to go to Venus. And no, there is not evidence. Apparently, there's no evidence of phosphine on Venus, if you remember from last week. So there's like no life there that we know of. It's miserable, which is what we thought it was. But hey, maybe we could go back. Uh, keep going with the questions. Uh, Christian Wontroba on YouTube is saying Carlo Rovelli, who is a theoretical physicist and also a popular science writer, is saying that there's no time. What gives with that? I don't know the full context of that question. Uh, I do know that some people, some physicists and some philosophers argue that the concept of time only exists inside our brains as a way for our consciousness to order our events and respond to things fine you can you can take that approach if you want there's really no evidence either way and as far as we can tell time exists outside ourselves uh, that see that it is generally the more common thinking is that time is a real thing that does exist outside of our consciousness we're not just making it up as we go along uh, however you can't separate that uh, this concept of time from our perception of time because they're basically the same thing, uh, especially because physics itself is so silent, uh, weirdly silent on the exact nature and origins of time. It's one of the biggest uh, issues we have, like one of the biggest unsolved problems. It's such a big unsolved problem uh, that I worked with my friends and collaborators of Siren Modern Dance here in New York City uh, to create a performance exploring the nature of time, not just through the lens of physics, but the, the lens of dance and art. And Obviously, the production of that and the performances of, of TikTok were put on hold because of a slightly, you know, overwhelming issue known as the coronavirus pandemic, uh, but it will be back as soon as things ease up. Uh, but Siren, I do want to give a shout out to Siren Modern Dance. They are having a per virtual performance next week of a project called Tina, uh, which is a beautiful, beautiful exploration of 
of coming together and joining hands and it's a virtual performance uh it's it's amazing uh, go to sirendance.org for the details it's a free event put on by the boston museum of science uh, moving on uh, Wes is asking about magnetars again. The electrons are stripped out. Though, yes, we think that uh, the electrons end up forming a crust, a very brittle and thin crust on the surface of the neutron star because they do get squeezed out and most of them go away in the process of making a neutron star. And uh, so, uh, so yeah, there's this like really cool like electron crust and then you get down into the, the weird stuff of the neutron star material, which I, let me tell you, the inside of a neutron star is weird, 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 weird. We get clumps of neutrons in weird elaborate structures. We call it the nuclear pasta because of the way the neutrons arrange themselves. And then the core of a neutron star, who knows? We actually have no clue what's happening on the deep inside of a neutron star. It might be another state of matter called quark matter or strange matter it might be just very very highly exotic neutrons we actually don't know it's actually a, a big unsolved problem in astrophysics zero skull is asking what happens if two perfect black bodies interface in a pre-universal state um i'm not exactly sure where to take that question you know i, I take all sorts of questions a black body is just an emitter. A black body is something that glows in, in radiation with a particular way, uh, with a certain distribution of frequencies. So a little bit of high frequency, a little bit of medium frequency, and then a couple low frequency stuff, uh, or vice versa, a little bit of high frequency stuff spit out. Black body is one of the most confusing terms in all of physics and astronomy. It just it refers to the experimental device that people used in the late 1800s to study this kind of effect, and that's it. So we've got, <laughs> good job, Dobby Dazzler. Watch Siren Monitor Dance while eating Dom's Cheese from Dom's Cheese Shop. I love that. Um, speaking of Dom's Cheese, should, should we have some cheese, folks? I think it's a good time for some cheese. So I, I, this, I'm so excited for this. I need to drink some water. Mm, mm. I'm so excited for this. So Dom's Cheese Shop in Avon, Connecticut is, uh, I reached out to them because they have an amazing cheese shop, amazing cheese shop. And I'm like, hey, I do a show. It's about astrophysics. It's not about cheese, but I happen to eat cheese every week. Uh, you you want to work something out? And they're like, wow, this sounds like the coolest idea ever. Can we please do that? So thank you, Nancy, for, for putting up the link to Dom's Cheese. So before you ask, yes, they do ship. It doesn't say on the website, but you can ask for shipment. They do cheese boxes. They will ship uh, cheese to you. Please, please, please go give Dom's Cheese some love because they gave me some love in the form of this amazing cheese, which I'm holding right here. It is wrapped up. We are going to unwrap it together. And they even sent me a description to read to you because this is fantastic. Eventually, like three years from now, by the way, this show has been on the air for more than three years and I finally have a cheese sponsor. I couldn't be more excited. So three years from now, the show will be 90% cheese and 10% space. So this cheese that I'm holding in my hand right now, I'm going to share with you tonight. It's called Black Betty. Black Betty is the outstanding, unrivaled black label Gouda that you wait for all year long. Only available during November and December, Black Betty is an extra-aged version of the goat's milk Gouda Brabender. It is named for Betty Coster, Amsterdam cheese shop owner, selector, and all-around cheese celeb. Maybe I could interview her on this show. Black Betty is a deeply rich and sweet, yet retains the savory tanginess of goat's milk. Its intense flavor, crystallized texture, and striking appearance make it a holiday hit among all who try. The cheese wheels are ripened in caves for more than a year. I'm, get, I'm salivating right now. At a slightly higher temperature to enhance its flavor and also to ensure proper drying. It's available seasonally as a flavor of pineapple and brown butter. The wheels are coated in black wax to distinguish it from other Brabender cheese and therefore is named Black Betty. Thank you to Dom's Cheese Shop. They do have Black Betty in stock and you can order it and get it shipped to you. Oh man, this is exciting. This is exciting. So cheers to Dom's Cheese Shop. Cheers to Black Betty. Let's look at this. Oh my God. 
goodness. I'll keep answering spacey questions. Don't worry. Look at that. Look at that. You can see that black wax rind. You can see that. Look at that crack that appeared. This is a very dry. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Here we go. Crumbly texture, crystallized interior. Look at that. This is going to be a treat. All right. Let's go. Wow. Wow. This is, um, <laughs> oh my God, this is a good cheese. Mmm. Mmm. So many notes, that crystallized texture, and then it just melts and coats your mouth. And then it's like, it's like a symphony that just keeps playing because you get one note here and then another. Mmm. That is amazing. That is amazing. Uh, thank you again to Dom's Cheese Shop. Vavon, Connecticut. That's domscheese.com. D-O-M-S cheese.com for providing the cheese of the week. Wow. Mmm. Okay. Let's do some science <laughs> as I destroy this cheese. Uh, we got another voicemail here. I'll play it. I'll play it so I can eat cheese. Hey, Paul, it's Chris from Massapequa, Long Island. I'm out here with my dog looking at Comet F3 Neowise. And uh, I've heard you talk about how the Earth's water was likely uh, brought here by comets. Um, so I looked up and saw that there's approximately 326 million trillion gallons of water on Earth. So I'm wondering, how is that even possible that comets were responsible for? So I wonder if you could shed some light on it for us. Thank you. Oh, great, great question, Chris. Sorry I didn't get to this like months ago during when Kama Neowise was actually visible. As you might have guessed, I have a slight backlog in questions. It tends to happen on this show. And I'm I'm doing my best by trying to do at least two voice sorry, I'm just seeing more cheese. Two voicemails a week. So here's uh, great question. Like, in order for comets to deliver water to the early Earth, like you said, they have to deliver a lot of water because there's a lot of water in the Earth's ocean and then most of it evaporates and goes away. And only a small fraction of it actually persists as the liquidy stuff that stays on the surface. How is this possible? It was possible because there was a, there were a lot of comets back then. Like, a lot. Like, not just a couple like, oh, look, Neil or Haley's. No, this is a lot of comets hitting all the time. What happened was the inner solar system near the sun, all the water, all the ices, or most of the water, most of the ices, most of the gas got evaporated away because of the intense heat of the sun. In the outer solar system, you can maintain the gas and the ices, and that's how we end up with the gas giant plants and the ice giant plants and things like the Kuiper Belt. And then in between, a region we call the ice line or the frost line, there was a mix of rocks and ices that could sometimes exist and sometimes not. And you ended up with almost a planet's worth of material in this region between Mercury and Jupiter. And then once the giant planets form, they start playing away, playing with all the gravity and sending all these rocks inward which bombarded the inner planets and deliver they took a lot of their ices with it so there's plenty of material available in the solar system to more than provide enough liquid water for all the earth's ocean i mean think of how much water water is the most common molecule in the entire universe is hydrogen and oxygen right there's more liquid water in europa the moon of jupiter than there is on the earth so we there's more water physically present in the solar system as a frozen than there is liquid so there's just so much water and then the early solar system when this event was happening i'm not talking like a comet every couple of years i'm talking like a comet a week for like a million years that's what I'm talking about a question If Paul eats some Dom's cheese. Will this contribute to the expansion of the universe? Because information of cheese is never lost. Mm. 
yes, yes, I believe I am contributing to cosmic expansion because I all I mean ultimately I'm increasing the entropy of the universe, but you know what? It tastes good. Uh, I did want to mention before I end today's show, I have a very cool announcement. Uh, I want to talk about, about a book. No, not this one, not How to Die in Space, which you can buy at bookstores uh, worldwide. Actually, I'm getting lovely notes from people all over the world who are enjoying this book. Uh, and you can also get autographed copies at pmsutter.com slash book. Also, I'm doing merchandise now because why not? So you know my slogan, if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. Yeah, you can get mugs and t-shirts with that printed on. And I'm drinking from a mug. Look, look, look. See, if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. Yeah, that's a real thing. That's pmsutter.com slash store. Uh, and you can access the autograph books, uh, the t-shirts and mugs, because that's just hilarious. You can go to domscheese.com. But books, books. I'm writing another book. Folks, I'm happy, happy, and proud to announce that I have signed a contract with the University of Toronto Press for my third book which I have already started writing and is due out uh, probably fall of 2021. Don't have an exact release date yet, but I'm guessing it's going to be fall of 2021 or spring of 2022. First, I have to write it. And it's it's actually a very difficult book to write. It's actually a different book. If you remember Blue Shift on this show, where I used to do like Blue Shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer. You know, I'm still going to do that every once in a while. But I, I would talk about science, the relationship of science with society. I also had a blog on my website called Ab Initio, which you can still find at pmstarter.com slash notes. I've taken all those thoughts and I'm going to write a book. The book is called The Sickness in Science, uh, The Problems with Modern Science and How to Fix Them. And it is my look at my own career in science, my experiences with science as a scientist, as a science communicator, and as someone who absolutely loves and is fascinated by science, of what I think it's doing wrong, of opportunities we're missing to do science better, to connect with the public better. So it's a very difficult book because it's a very critical book. It's a very critical book uh, from someone who loves the thing that they are writing about. And so you'll see. I think I think it's going to be a, a beautiful book. Uh, it's going to be, it's a very powerful and cathartic book for me. Uh, there's a lot of things that I have not talked about on this show or in my blog that, that really need to be talked about. So look for it uh, like a year from now. Don't worry, I'll remind you. And I'll continue trying to <clears throat> sell merchandise like if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. Like autograph copies of my book and showing some love to domscheese.com. Seriously, please order. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter. And this show is brought to you by you. Visit patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can contribute. Thank you, Nancy Graziano, for wrangling the Space Cadets and producing this show. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com for all the links. And of course, thanks again, Space Cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing. End of transmission.